สวัสดีครับท่านผู้มีเกียรติทุกท่านนะครับยินดีต้อนรับสู่งานประชุมอีกรอบหนึ่งนะครับวันนี้เป็นวันที่สองนะครับค่ะยังไงเออสำหรับวันนี้เนี่ยกิจกรรมทั้งวันนี้เต็มที่เลยนะครับมีตั้งแต่ช่วงเช้ามีกิจกรรมทางด้านวิชาการนะครับแต่ช่วงบ่ายเนี่ยตอนช่วงพิธีปิดจะมีกิจกรรมที่อยากจะเรียนเชิญทุกท่านเข้าร่วมนะครับเป็นกิจกรรมในพิธีปิดครับค่ะเป็น closing ceremony ของเราจะมีการแจกรางวัลเหมือนเคยนะคะมีการแจกรางวัลแล้วก็เป็นการจะมีกิจกรรมซึ่งในแต่ละปีจะไม่ซ้ํากันนะครับซึ่งปีนี้เราก็ยังไม่ค่อยมั่นใจว่าจะเป็นกิจกรรมอะไรนะครับไม่ไม่แน่ใจไม่แน่ใจนะครับไม่แน่ใจแต่ไม่มั่นใจดีกว่าค่ะมาดูแต่ว่าเป็นกิจกรรมที่อยากจะเรียนเชิญทุกท่านเข้าร่วมนะครับเพราะว่าจะเป็นกิจกรรมพิเศษเพื่อให้พวกเราได้มีกิจกรรมร่วมกันนะครับแล้วก็ร่วมกันผลักดันนโยบายต่างๆตามที่เราได้สรุปกันในวันนี้ในช่วงท้ายนะครับเราจะมีกิจกรรมในเรื่องของการแรปอัพให้ให้แต่ละท่านได้ทราบว่า2วันที่ผ่านมาเราได้ความรู้อะไรบ้างและพวกเราจะช่วยกันผลักดันนโยบายต่างๆยังไงในอนาคตนะครับค่ะโดยเฉพาะท่านที่ไม่ได้เข้าในเซสชันที่เป็น parallel session ที่อยู่ในเวลาเดียวกันนะคะท่านก็จะได้รับรู้ว่า,า parallel session ที่อยู่ต่อเนื่องกันในเวลาเดียวกันนั้นเขาพูดถึงอะไรแล้วก็มี policy มี recommendation อย่างไรบ้างค่ะสำหรับท่านที่ไม่ทราบว่าในการประชุมของเราเนี่ยนะครับจริงๆเรามีกลุ่มเราเรียกว่า rap ทัวร์นะครับซึ่งจะทำหน้าที่จะเป็นท่านอาจารย์พยาบาลแล้วก็ผู้อาจจะมีแพทย์ด้วยนะครับมาช่วยในการรวบรวมข้อมูลในแต่ละเซสชันนะครับแล้วก็หลังจากนั้นก็จะมีการสรุปนะครับโดยท่านอาจารย์สวิตแล้วก็จะมีอาจารย์วีรศักดิ์จะมาสรุปอีกทีในช่วงเซสชันสุดท้ายนะครับซึ่งเซสชันสุดท้ายนี่ก็ทําให้ทุกท่านเห็นภาพรวมได้มากยิ่งขึ้นครับสําหรับในเช้านี้นะครับเรามีกิจกรรมแรกนะครับเป็นเรื่องของ parallel session เป็นการบรรยายเรื่องของ learning environment นะครับซึ่งวันนี้เราได้รับเกียรติจากดร์ไซมอนแพทเทิร์นนะครับมาบรรยายในหัวข้อนี้นะครับอขอกล่าวประวัติสั้นๆนะครับของท่านดรไซมอนแพทเทิร์นผมพูดเป็นภาษาไทยนะครับเพราะว่าเมื่อเมื่อสักครู่แอบไปคุยกับอาจารย์ดรไซมอนเรียบร้อยแล้วนะครับจริงๆเรามีอินเทอร์พิเตอร์ด้วยนะครับแต่กําลังรออยู่นิดนึงนะครับงั้นผมพูดภาษาไทยเดี๋ยวอาจารย์อรรัตจะกรุณาไปเป็นภาษาอังกฤษอีกทีหนึ่งนะครับครับเอาเอาเอาวันนี้เลยครับครับคือดรไซมอนเนี่ยท่านทํางานอยู่ที่ Faculty of Health Science University of Adelaide นะครับเป็นเซ็นเตอร์ดีเรกเตอร์ของ Adelaide Health Simulation Skill Center นะครับซึ่งเมืองอดลเนี่ยเป็นเมืองที่อยู่ทางด้านตอนตอนใต้ของประเทศออสเตรเลียนะครับถ้าท่านทราบก็เป็นเมืองที่มีไวน์นะครับถ้าใครชอบไวน์ก็อาจจะหลังจากเซสชันนี้อาจจะพูดคุยกับดรไซมอนอีกทีหนึ่งนะครับเรื่องของไวน์ค่ะ it is a good chance today that we have Dr. Simon Patton for our speaker today for the topic uh, learning environment Dr. Simon is a center director uh, the a d e l a i d e Health Simulation and Skill Center. On this occasion, I would like to invite Dr. Simon for his speaker, please. Hello. Um, So, uh, first of all, I would like to start off by thanking um, the hosts for inviting me to come to Bangkok. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here, um, and uh, hopefully, I'll try and provide um, some interesting um, thoughts and topics from uh, Australia and a little bit towards where we're heading. So, I'm going to talk about developing new learning environments. Um, this conference has been so much about change and looking to the future that I thought this was most appropriate. That um, we uh, talk about some of the kind of disruptive technologies that are starting to change the education world, and look to see how we might master some of these technologies um, to really benefit our students, but also ultimately the patients. So, um, my background is that I'm a critical care physician, and I am the director of simulation for the School of Medicine and the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Adelaide. And if nobody knows where Adelaide is, it's in the south of Australia, 
um, and it's very much known for its wine country. Um, this is where the best wine in Australia is produced. So if anything, um, come over and have a glass of wine, and maybe while you're there we can talk about some uh, simulation or something along those lines. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, virtual learning environments. So um, some people may uh, be quite familiar with these learning environments. This is the University of Adelaide's um, learning environments. They're known as um, Blackboard and Moodles. And these are really um, integrated tools that enable the management of online, student, uh, online learning, um, student assessment, and access to resources. So this is really a one-stop shop for all your uh, materials for the um, for your students, so they are unable to go through. And if we have a closer look, um, we see that there's research focus groups. Um, we can uh, look, and there's the handbooks that they have, program information, their schedules. Um, there's information about examinations, course assessment, and their evaluations. So really, they're able to go there and pull off their slides and aspects from there. So I, I think this is pretty traditional. Um, from people from universities, uh, you have these online? Hey, can you raise your hand? Yeah, if you? Excellent. Cool. So I personally, you know, it's a nice example. But uh, what we're moving on is that we need to look at where the world is changing now. So to me, this is a little bit of yesterday. Um, or what we see now is people are really starting to adapt into mobile learning. And within mobile learning, we start to see where people are actually, where our students, where our young professionals are starting to learn. And if we look at the top, 52% um, of people um, start actually doing some of their learning in bed after waking up. Now, I have to admit, I am a little bit guilty of this. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I check my emails, I maybe respond a little bit to them. It's part of being in a connected world. And our students are the similar. Um, the health professionals are moving from that side. But what we also see that's interesting is that while at school or work, we also find that our students are actually getting involved in mobile learning. And this isn't necessarily prescribed learning. This is asynchronous learning. This is learning when they're on their lunch breaks or while they're uh, waiting for a lesson to start, that they're looking up resources, that they're actually starting to find information before. So they might know that they're having a lecture on pediatrics or some aspect of pediatrics. They might be online already reading about topics. And this adds a real challenge to our, our, our lectures, our tutorials, because a lot of the time our students are really finding information from across the world on, these, um, on topics that we are about to talk about. Moving down, we find that um, students are also, 74% uh, of people are actually learning while they're traveling to work on a bus. Um, again, I'm afraid I'm guilty as charged. This, this research was quite damning on me because I realized how much I am uh, connected into learning all the time. Um, so I, I really enjoy getting on the bus in the morning and taking my 40-minute journey where I read a couple of papers, maybe, or I listen to a podcast and I catch up with what is changing in my specialty. 17% um, do it while um, exercising. Um, again, I, I am guilty as charged. I often listen to an audio podcast while going for a run. Um, I started to realize that I feel that I'm a little bit obsessed by the amount of time that I'm now spending learning. So uh, this was a great insight into myself. Um, so um, we see that people are really looking for every opportunity to learn, and we need to start to adapt to provide this. 55% um, um, learn while waiting in queues. Now, uh, I live, Adelaide's quite a small city. Uh, uh, it's a million people, and uh, from that side, it, um, we, we, we don't have a lot of queues, and so it would have to be really fast. But the point that comes from this is that people want short sound bites. They want very quick episodes. They don't want an hour, and in fact, a lot of the studies show that if we do an hour, we're only taking around about 17% of that information in. So that's a lot of time being put through. The ideal length of time is around about six to seven minutes for a short electronic 
online version of information. So we need to be to the point. We need to be capturing that information and providing it in short bursts. Now, it doesn't mean that the whole episode has to be um, in six minutes. It can be that each topic changes every six minutes. Um, and that's where we've got to start to adapt our teaching. And that's a maximal time where actually all that information is really being held by the students. We also see 46% in bed before they go to sleep. I have to say, I have an eight-month-year-old baby. When I go to bed, I'm going to bed. I'm not studying. Um, so, but it does show where our students are learning. And we've got to start to adapt and take this um, on. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the idea of social learning environments. Um, and um, this is defined by just in 2009 as individuals and groups that come together and co-create content, share knowledge and experiences, and learn from one another to improve their professional productivity. So what we're finding here are that groups are coming together across the world, across the countries, to actually form little working groups, interest groups, in what they want to build and define, and what they want to start to develop themselves. And there's a lot of tools out there that do this. And this faces massive challenges for universities. Because we, I've shown you our virtual learning environment where we said, this is what we want you to learn. And yet our students and our junior doctors, our nurses, our physios, our OTs are going and forming these social learning environments. And they're finding this information themselves that is outside of our control. And that makes universities a little bit nervous. Um, in a study here, they looked at how, what people do um, when they want to find answers. So I remember when I was a uh, junior doctor, an intern on the ward, and if I needed a clinical answer, I went wandering around the hospital wards, um, hoping that I might come across another colleague who'd maybe be able to help me, and maybe we'd work something out or we'd think about it. What we find now is that students are able to post a question on Twitter and they put the question on there, and because it's an international environment, it doesn't matter whether this is a night shift or a day shift. There is someone awake and someone who is able to actually link in. So they select who their mentors are online through Twitter. These are not our mentors that we prescribe to them. So I want to hear a patient's story about a specific condition. So I try and find a patient in my town. I, I look through the hospital because I really want to find uh, a patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. I really, I know about it. I've read about it and I really need to find someone. I need to understand about these symptoms. I need to understand about these signs. And so I wander through the wards trying to find someone. Now, people read blogs from the, per the actual patient's perspective, and they watch YouTube videos of people actually demonstrating incredibly high-quality teaching videos involving these patients. And that's for free. I want to be up to date. And in 2000, I might go to the library once a week to read a, a textbook. But the textbook is published, and it was submitted for publication two years earlier. Um, so when it's there, it's already out of date, when it's actually a brand new edition. Now, I use an RSS feed, and I follow hundreds of journals. And what that does is it picks out the topics that are of interest to myself and provides it on easy access on my phone. That is something I do. I use an app called QR Reader, and it, I have selected out over a 1,000 journals, and it picks out very specifically the articles that are relevant to my clinical practice because I don't have the time to go through all of those journals. I want to work on a manuscript with my team. It's really interesting. I, pub I read this, and I want to publish something. So beforehand, I would, in 2000, I'd gather around a table after I'd looked at all the rosters and tried to find a suitable time when everybody happens to be off so that we can meet. So in about a month, we might get a couple of hours. Now we use Google Drop Docs. So we were able to collaborate internationally um, at a drop of a hat. So people can work on the same document through the night, through the day, because it's different time zones. And we can actually increase our productivity this way. 
I don't use Google Docs, I use Dropbox, but it's the same principle. So what we have here is the elements for constructing social learning environments. And this is something that we need to start to think about into the future. And one of the biggest things is that these are free. These are open at the moment. So we are able to harness some of this material that already exists to develop it in ourselves. And I'm going to give you a few examples. So within the social networking environment, everybody here will know Facebook and LinkedIn and Ning. Well, studies have shown that actually health professionals don't like to learn using Facebook. We may still do it, but for a given an opportunity and a choice, um, most people like to keep their personal and their professional lives separate. So to try and form learning environments through Facebook can be quite challenging. And this is where LinkedIn comes in. It's a professional social environment. It gives us resources and allows us to post. But alternatively, what we've started to experiment with in our case-based learning and our problem-based learning is the use of Ning. And Ning is a private social network. So within our problem-based learning group, what we might do is create our own personal um, uh, social network. So maybe only of about 10 students and a tutor, but that tutor could be across 20 of these. And they follow up the feeds, the comments, the posts, the videos that are going on to this social network, and they're able to see. So I might start off my problem-based learning with a video of a patient. I might pose some questions in this social network, and then the students might follow it up. They might go on to find other resources and post this for other people to actually um, read and go through. And that's where tagging or content comes in. So I made this presentation by tagging content as I was reading it. And what that means is, as I was actually going through and reading resources, I would actually take snapshots or I'd take, tag photos and put it into pin interest. And that gives me a kind of big kind of box of information that I can go through as I'm reading. It's saving me time. And that's what our students can do. So they can use things such as Delicious um, or Diageo, and they are able to find resources, a video, an article, a paper, and tag that into a resource that all the students can actually follow and go through. And again, we can be involved with this process, and we can actually help to guide and check the quality. What we then have is file sharing. So once we create presentations, rather than necessarily keeping them to themselves, we can post them up. I'm using Prezi here. Um, and uh, what it is is an open access um, file sharing network as well as a PowerPoint substitute. Every single one of my talks always go up online so that others beyond this audience can also view and um, share them. Um, other alternatives are linking in with SlideShare, and this is useful while joining in with LinkedIn. So it allows your slides to go through your own personal account and people to follow and see where you are. And this creates interest, international interest groups, and this helps us to develop to develop our materials faster. I don't have to develop all my materials. I can collaborate with people from across the world with specialist skills that I don't have. Once I've created and I've shared these prezies or these slide shares, I might also organize maybe for a Skype meeting where I talk. This has now become quite a regular part of my work. Um, at 6 o'clock in the morning, I often get up and have a chat with colleagues over in Harvard or Stanford or other areas in, in America, as well as collaborating with people within Europe. I actually use Google Hangouts as I find the stability is a little bit better, but they're same principles. When we start to look at collaborating with others, we've got Udutu, um, Etherpad, which allows us to um, join and, and work on the same kind of materials together. And this, again, as we talked about with Google Docs and Dropbox, allows us to start to um, create information and edit files together without meeting up. And this, again, relates to this 
asynchronous learning. This is where people are learning and developing materials on their own time when they want to, not when it's prescribed. As we go on and develop, I know that quite a lot of people here are using WordPress to blog and put out their information already. I went to an excellent talk yesterday uh, where they talked about how they put all their resources from One Health onto this WordPress document for people to reuse. That's an example of where we're moving. Um, the more that we can put out and the more quality we can share, the better our own programs will be. And that brings me nicely on to podcasting. This is where the primary um, information for my continuing personal development comes to. I follow several people that I now regard as high quality, and I share information with them, but I listen to what they have to say when they do their reviews. It enables when a new paper to come out, I can read it, but also I can listen to hundreds of people's views on it and actually get a collective um, angle and analysis. This is very useful in saving time and also sharing ideas. And this brings me on to the RSS feeds. And what that allows me to do is rather than having to actually look when a new podcast or a new update has happened, it's actually beamed directly to my, uh, my resources. Um, so there's lots of different um, software or apps now that collate this information, but essentially it's allowing an ongoing link. And microblogging is where I'll finish up and actually continue. Is we know Twitter's out there and it's huge there, but how do we harness this? Most of our students will probably be utilizing it, um, but how do we turn that into an educational powerhouse? And this is where I'm gonna talk about problem-based learning via or case-based learning via Twitter. So what, what we have here is Dundee University has created a hashtag called Flu Scenario. Now, within Twitter, essentially, people can then type in this hashtag of, the, of this hash and flu scenario, and they're able then to follow the conversation. So in this topic, they are, they've gone to go with the idea to show the importance of flu and epidemics and the, discuss the importance of emergency planning. But they also wanted to use it as an example of how Twitter can be used to expand educational horizons. So they created a discussion group on this topic. They went on to then create cases where people would be, they would have a lecturer sitting there and able to tweet answers to the students' questions and watch and follow as the students ask each other ideas about where to go next. So what we can see like this is a student asking, have you had this before? Does it, does it radiate anywhere? And it's the answer coming through. It's been going on for a few years now. And it's getting worse recently. Food's no going down now either. No for the past two days. Sorry, that was my Scottish accent. Um, and what they've tried to do is actually put through the slang and the terminology to make it feel more real. So how, does this, how is this useful? Well, now that our students are around, we're reducing travel times. We're allowing students in rural environments to actually engage within the city life in the same manner. We're not requiring that busy clinicians have to leave their clinics to come in and hold problem-based learning sessions. Actually, they can sit in their office or in their clinic and hold this session. It maximizes their clinical time and maximizes their educational time at the same. This does not alter um, outcomes. And this is where a, uh, a, a survey of what educators and apps they're currently using about how to develop their new, so, um, their own um, educational material. And what we can see here is really large is Evernote, Notability, and Google Drive are really becoming the main kind of sources of people to save their files and share from that side. Um, as well as educators using Explain Everything is a very useful whiteboard substitute. Which brings me on to the uh, biggest disruptive change that we are facing. Now, I'm not sure whether anybody here is familiar with free, free open access 
medical education. And certainly in Australia, this is one of our biggest challenges as, as well as opportunities. And what it is, is an idea that medical education should be free and it should be available. And it's really created a bit of a following um, uh, across the world where we're now seeing um, resources from experts coming up free all over. In fact, it's incredible how the, the last count is several billion different resources on topics now that are coming open every day. And this is an example. This is Dr. Smith's ECG blog. So um, this ECG blog is essentially all about ECGs. It starts off very simple and goes into advanced ECGs, looking at the subtleties and the changes that can happen. And I have to say, the ECG um, ana analysis skills of um, this person is um, second to none in the world. So why should our students not have the opportunity to learn from this gentleman? Why would they get a second-rate learning opportunity that I can provide in our university? I can read ECGs. I think I'm pretty good at them. I'm nowhere near in the same league as this gentleman, and neither is many others. So what they are, this person gets to do is he puts out all this information and people comment. And they also comment if he makes a mistake. But we can see here that this page view alone has had nearly 4 million at the point of when I took this screenshot. That is a bigger class size than we can ever imagine. And that's people all reading and analyzing it. So why should we create our own teaching session when actually there's better teaching sessions out there. That's a resource. That's money that we can reinvest into different areas. Or maybe we can use this as a flipped classroom where we ask him to go through certain pages or certain topics of this website, and then we'll discuss them in more detail afterwards. This is the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine. They've also done a similar kind of uh, approach, and they put out resources for free. They've started to look at clinicians within this angle. And what they have is, it's called a JAMIT, which is a just in a minute instant tutorials. And the aim is to gather this short attention span of individuals and aim for everything under six minutes. What they're trying in this particular thing is to target clinicians who are in rural areas and maybe don't have to deal with these patients as regularly as they need to. So these are critical care topics. An example here is just a simple one minute on how to do an adrenaline infusion. So people, clinicians can watch this, it takes a minute, and they can actually, while they're managing patients, watch this video and then actually go on to correctly administer adrenaline infusions. It also has how to perform chest strains in a minute. These are now being utilized by clinicians across Australia to remind themselves this is not a primary teaching aid. This is about reminding people, keeping the knowledge up to date. But I'm a director of a simulation center. And as much as my interest very much sits within the social learning environment, I also would be amiss to not give you a talk on simulation and its absolute benefits. However, I think both of them go hand in hand. So the term simulation has many different meanings and it often misunderstood. It has a range of modalities, settings, or learning environments, and target groups. It's being increasingly used for education, training, research, and assessment. And one of my key areas of interest is in assessment. And what we've seen in Australia is a change where simulation is now becoming a key examination modality for the college examinations. So this is doctors just becoming consultants will sit simulation exams. And within these exams, we're looking at interprofessional skills. So bringing it in and trying to tam it, tag it in is I'm going to talk a little bit about Bloom's taxonomy. I know everybody in the room is now sitting bolt upright with interest at the sheer mention of Bloom's taxonomy. I'll try and keep it brief. The social learning environment to me sits within 
the knowledge and the comprehension. This is my pre-reading. These are my resources that I'm putting out or I'm directing my students to. I want them to listen to this podcast. I want them to read these aspects of this blog. I want them to go through so that they're absolutely prepared and we're then ready for a discussion. Because my simulation is only going to, fit, is only going to target these areas. I'm interested in the application of their knowledge the analysis and identifying and analyzing the information that is provided from these um, simulations and how they then synthesize this information to better patient care. I will not use simulation to give me knowledge. And the reason behind that angle is that if I want to impart the knowledge, I've already shown you that there's a blog that has four million views they can sit there and they can spend the time to read about an ECG there. I'm not going to use a mannequin that costs a large amount of money for an hour to teach them an ECG. That can be done elsewhere and for cheap, for free, essentially. What I need them to do is be able to analyze that ECG in a stressful situation and actually utilize the other key clinical findings and information to better provide for the patient. So if you aim your learning outcomes towards the knowledge and the comprehension you've got and use simulation, you've got yourself the most expensive tutorial you can find. We need to go through. So the definition of simulation is a technique, not a technology, to replace or amplify real experiences with guided experiences that evoke or replicate substantial aspects of the real world in a fully interactive manner. Now, this is from David Gamma, who is really seen as the grandfather of simulation. He created the first mannequins within anesthetics and is now deputy dean of Stanford. I particularly like this definition because it focuses on it being a technique and people often get distracted by the technology, the machines that go ping. Um, they want to see, oh, that, that mannequin, is, it does everything. It blinks and uh, it breathes and, 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 and its arms move. But this isn't particularly useful for our training environment that we're going through. So we need to identify what is the best modality we're going through. And what we've got to understand is we've got the preparation, the simulation, but then the debriefing. And this is where people learn, is within the phases after the simulation. And we need our, our, our tutors to be skilled debriefers. It's also rather controversially described as replacing or amplifying real experiences. Now, the federal government has uh, talked about, in Australia, simulation replacing a certain amount of clinical placement. And I'm going to come back to that shortly. But also, in my mind, it's an incredible tool for creating enhanced um, clinical placement. And that's where we use simulation before they go on clinical placement to gain their skills to hone in their approaches for patient care before they go on and see a real patient. That way, the tutors that are on the clinical placement have um, less focus on teaching the basics, but more focus on finding the interest, getting hold of the students to really start to synthesize that information. But it's key that these simulations have to um, replicate the real world. They need to be true to life. Otherwise, you're cheating your students. And you're potentially giving them false learning, because they'll believe that's what should happen. So we need to be careful. Simulations also, as much as it is a tool for good, it can be used as a tool for bad. So we need to ensure that our simulations have the right objectives, the right outcomes, so are planned appropriately, and are also fully interactive. We don't want passive learning. We want active learning. We want people up and about. Within Australia, we had a Health Workforce Australia, which no longer exists, incidentally, from our new government. But within that side, they deemed that simulation learning environments was a key um, to the success of our health workforce and our planning for the future. 
And what they noted was, as demand for clinical placements increases, we need to look to innovative and affordable ways to deliver clinical training. And they felt that simulation was a tool that could be utilized there. One of the biggest challenges we have in Australia is we have a large land mass and a tiny population. The range and opportunities for clinical placement are becoming more and more strained, and simulation is being used to replace clinical placement. And these I will talk about later in ward simulations. Um, with these are our pressures we're facing. We have high ratios of doctors and nurses in rural environments because we might have a population of 100, about 1,000 kilometers from any other location. And we need to therefore provide care for this. And I'm going to talk um, about this in my next topic today. So within this environment, they actually believe so much, they afforded us $90 million to develop simulation through the whole of Australia. That was a huge expenditure, and in my mind, a mistake. So what we ended up with um, is simulation everywhere, but very little quality. We had no ongoing funding, and now what we're doing is winding back all these simulation centers that have been created into, more, into fewer numbers with higher quality outcomes. So the advantage of simulation, look, its ability to reproduce a range of um, learning opportunities is absolutely key. I can guarantee that um, of my students in sixth year, they will all see 40 key case presentations. So four zero case presentations that are key to their learning. Everybody will have experienced an acute pulmonary edema. Everybody will have experienced an asthma. Everybody will have experienced pancreatitis. I know that because they go through my simulation center and get each one of those cases. Um, I can't guarantee that on clinical placement. They attend an emergency department, and it's really what happens on the day. And so students at the end of a month or two month attachment will have very different experiences. I have the ability to match learners' needs with a learning activity with appropriate complexity. So my first year students have much more simple cases because I'm trying to really get their approach and the basics instilled into them. Whereas my most advanced consultants that come to my simulation center, I will throw everything at them. It's a bit of fun. Um, its key is it's standard, reliable, and fair. So everybody will get the same experience. Everybody will be able to turn up at 9 o'clock on a day to experience this, and I will ensure that I'm making it fair for my learners and safe, which is the crucial bit. It's able to provide detailed assessment of learners' capabilities. I can tell you exactly what they've done, and I can also review it again to show how they performed it. I can, if it's challenged, I can get an independent assessor to come back and review what they did to remark it. It enables learners to make mistakes crucially and learn from them without harming patients. So rather than sending students out on their first trip and making a mess with a patient, making an error, or a junior doctor that makes a critical error that leads to harm to the patient, they can make those errors in my simulation center, and I can reboot my mannequin. So I don't try and prevent them from making these errors, because we all learn from our mistakes. And what we've got to do is capitalize on this. We have to give them the opportunity to make the mistakes in a safe environment, and then explain and discuss about why they made that mistakes. Where is the root in their understanding that doesn't work? What is their, what is their, their key problem within their analysis that means that they can't understand um, why this, they should do this treatment? But also, as much as it doesn't harm the patients, by taking that method, it doesn't harm the students. I can remember making some critical errors when I was uh, a junior doctor in an unsupervised position. I remember fearing those errors, and I can remember having sleepless nights over those errors. I can remember going home at the end of work and being really scared and worried about my patient because I was in a situation where I didn't have the knowledge or the experience to deal with it. 
I can take that fear and anxiety away by providing them the experiences in simulation settings so that when, they di when it does happen, they can know uh, that they have the emotional support afterwards to get through these things, and they can just focus on the learning. So what do we use? What are our tools? Well, this is Cyril. Um, Cyril is an elderly gentleman that suffers falls, has many comorbidities, that often has to present to hospital, but also is needs to be managed in a social environment. Cyril has walking problems, he's catheterized, he's got heart problems, kidney problems, liver problems. He's had strokes, he's recovered from strokes, he's gone to stroke rehab. He really is the mecca for diagnostics. However, Cyril is actually a 39-year-old woman. And Cyril is a hybrid simulation. And what we have here is high fidelity makeup or moulage to recreate the environments we need to provide for our students. So it's not limited. So what we have here is a special kind of mask that feels and looks like skin. It is literally movie level makeup. And it's easy to put on and take off. And this provides me now with my educator sitting behind Cyril, who can take on the, all the experiences they need to make a point of, especially in older aged care, which I couldn't use with an actor. I certainly can't have an 89-year-old actor falling onto their hip. I might actually have to do some work. What we also have is more well-known mannequins, and these are called human patient simulators. And we have here the latest um, uh, pregnancy mannequin, where they have lifelike skin, and um, they breathe, they blink, um, and they will deliver. And what we have here is utilizing it for team training um, in an obstetric cases. So we actually recreate our operating theaters um, and allow the students to actually take part, or the postgraduate um, um, post learners to take part in their own roles. And this is an excellent means for interprofessional practice and education. We also, and I'm going into the high-tech bit to keep everybody awake in the morning, is the laparoscopic and endoscopic simulators. And I bring this in because, again, it comes down to affordability. These are coming cheaper, but they're expensive still. So we need to make a case for their use. We need to know that this is a worthwhile and not another toy. So what we found in, uh, by performing and using these laparoscopic and endoscopic simulators is that our learners quickly acquire the skills at a faster rate than when they traditionally go forward and learn on patients. So we are able to provide service provision in our hospitals faster with fewer um, complications. We also utilize audiovisual technology. And this is our sim lab looking at the way to teach intubation in a different manner. And what we have here is a range of nurses as well as doctors with a patient simulation. Now, the doctors are actually learning on the skill, but they're also learning about the interprofessional skills that's in, required in an emergency intubation. And we have here the, uh, the doctor doing an intubation with a video laryngoscope so that learners are able to see the actual view that the doctor gets to see. So they're not looking over someone's shoulder, or they're not trying to get a view around a corner. They're actually able to see what it is they're looking at. They get to see the anatomical landmarks. And what we also have here is the actual intubation tray. So the nurses are seeing what an airway nurse does real time. So they're able to understand about the laying out, the key requirements about trying to anticipate the problems and deal with the complications. And the whole time, we get to see about the monitoring as well. We can see what's happening to the patient as the scenario progresses. This is a very simple piece of kit, but it's probably our most utilized for our, our students. And what it is, is a feedback device for CPR, so cardiopulmonary resuscitation. 
as well as ventilation. And what it does is it records everything that people do. And we can then download that to the person, the people themselves. So they actually get to see real time what their performance is um, with chest compressions, with ventilations, their speed, their depth, um, how long they've managed to have the hands-off time and keeping it to a minimum before they've delivered shocks. We've now been rolling this program out across South Australia using this, and I can tell you the first results were pretty shocking on the performance of our hospitals and our hospital staff. Um, the three years or the four year refresher courses on um, advanced life support are not frequent enough. And by providing these tools and leaving them available for our learners to use asynchronously, they can, in their breaks, they can go on and practice and see what their performance is, and they can grow better at this. This has also been replicated for intubation of neonates. By providing some tools in a neonatal mannequin, they showed that um, the doctors that provide the neonatal resuscitations became far more advanced and skilled in intubating in an emergency than if they were just left to traditional courses. And we use those tools in uh, gamification of learning. And this is where we turn our learning to try and make it more interactive by actually uh, turning it into games. So we create challenges and competitions between our students to perform. And what we found here is there's certain areas of gamification that works. Within the play, we see that our children and animals, they learn by playing. And we see that as well as survival skills. But what we also found is that by providing certain computer games and gaming to our surgeons, operations um, were completed at 27% faster than the norm. And there were 37% fewer errors made by the surgeons in practice. And it's now been mandated that surgeons play 10 minutes of a computer game before each operation. And that is brought time back. It, the time is saved, and the error rates are fewer. It's interesting. And it starts to go into the idea of flow theory, and actually trying to keep people in the zone. And within this idea, we don't want people too relaxed or bored, perhaps how you're feeling now. Um, and we don't want you too anxious. Um, we want you to be in a, the best state to be able to develop the best care for our patients. And games are very useful at creating that. But we've got to be careful not to fall into the trap of the Goldilocks theory. And this is where we make things too challenging or too easy, that they're either too anxious or too simple and boring. It's absolutely key in engaging our students and turning our classrooms from bored environments where people are playing with their mobile phones, updating their Facebook for social purposes, um, and um, generally not paying attention, to turning them into actually being really active participants in the classroom. And this real focus is on skills mastery and providing ways where we can actually start to develop where, um, methods where we can get this 10,000 hours of required practice to be a master. We need to think about the rewards and what our motivation is for our students attending. And therefore, this is absolutely a crucial ingredient in actually turning our lessons into more interactive games of learning. And some of those aspects that are being looked on is within immersive environments. And within this side, we're seeing a lot of virtual reality coming through. Um, in South Australia, one of the key aspects that we've looked, that's been developed at this point is about creating a virtual learning environment um, which is involved in postpartum hemorrhage. And from that, we have difficulty with our size of our state and reaching everybody but we can provide learning opportunities online. And actually, we have people that take up characters within this learning environment, and so they can interact even though they're thousands of kilometers away. 
one of the, one of the most exciting things in the aspects in the development of virtual reality is the creation of uh, the the reduction in price rather of the tools. In this video that I'm about to show is how orthopedic surgeons in France have started using a tool called the Oculus Rift. And the Oculus Rift is still being available as a research tool and a development tool, and it's essentially a fully um, virtual headset that costs less than $300. Beforehand, we had it at thousands upon thousands, and what we're looking at now is instead of potentially buying a mannequin at $100,000, we're wondering whether we can buy a headset at $300. From that side, we could use the same investment to really open up how much accessibility we have to simulation. And our big challenge is how do we reduce the cost? How do we make it more affordable in line with the federal government and Health Workforce Australia? And I'm just going to uh, play this video for you now. It is widely admitted that surgery is an art. It's a difficult art because you only realize what surgery is when you do it for yourself. When you are a surgeon in training, you attend a lot of surgical procedure, but you're very rarely in the place of the primary surgeon. This project uses virtual reality to improve surgical training by putting the trainee into the shoes of the surgeon. When you're attending a procedure as an assistant, you always have a task to perform. Whether it's maintaining the leg of a patient or handling instruments, it's very hard to concentrate on the surgery itself. And it can be very difficult to follow what's going on exactly because you don't see what the surgeon sees. A small dual camera system was placed on Dr. Gregory's head where he was performing a total hip replacement. The cameras are approximately at his high level, so they actually film what he sees. This system records great footage of the surgery in stereoscopic 3D with a great field of view that would bring this immersive effect when seen with the Oculus Rift. Watching the scene filmed through the Oculus Rift, you feel like you're in the surgeon's body. You're virtually in the operating theater. So this is, this is the direct feed from the Oculus Rift at this point is now what you're watching. So this isn't how we used to see virtual reality. This is actually the quality of the imagery that is going through. So just to give you an eye, and it's filmed from the eye level of the surgeon that was going, happening beforehand. You can turn your head in any direction and the 3D scene seems very natural. And if you're more interested in what the nurse or the assistant is doing, just turn your head and you can watch them as well. currently developing system of live surgery with virtual reality. A surgeon will be able to attend a new surgical procedure performed, for instance, in Paris, in his or her sofa, in the US, in England, or anywhere else in the world. Virtual reality will revolutionize surgical training, not only initial training, but also experienced surgeons' lifelong training in new techniques. It was made possible by the Moveo Foundation. This foundation supports research projects enhancing security of orthopedic surgical procedure with the use of modern digital technology. So I think this is uh, an example of, again, a disruptive technology that's coming through. And what we see here is the opportunity to learn from experts in individual operations, again, without that looking over someone's shoulder or trying to go through. But crucially, what we're talking about here is people internationally 
filming this so that everybody internationally can see it. It's not confined to our silo. It's not confined to the Royal Adelaide Hospital and only the staff within. It's confined only internationally. Just the world will be able to follow this kind of side. And that gives us enormous opportunity, again, to select out what it is our learning that we really need and what are our goals. We don't have to keep on reinventing the wheel. And I think that's my key kind of point that I want to go through and leave you with, is that overall, there are new learning environments coming. The world is getting increasingly connected, and we need to select and use these technologies and harness these for the better of our students. It should lead to a reduction in our workload, a benefit for our patients, but uh, uh, our, our um, benefit for our students, but ultimately a uh, benefit for our patients overall. I hope that's been interesting, and I am more than happy to take any questions. Any questions from the floor? Or you maybe share your experience in Thailand? Uh, Professor Vanisha. Thank you, Simon, for your uh, uh, that you highlight such an interesting topic uh, for learning environment uh, in the new era of, of uh, medical education. First of all, I'd like to, to share with you for our university for information technology used by our students by page views. And we got information that our students use most of the time on social network, not on education. So uh, I would like to, to, uh, to ask you, uh, how do you, how do you motivate both um, family members and students to uh, actively engage in information technology uh, to enhance their learning process and environment? Thank you. Yes, so that's a, an excellent question. Um, so a lot of that is actually educating the students as well as the educators on how to utilize that, um, that technology. Um, we need to make sure that our students are aware of the resources that are out there, but also direct them to those resources. So they need to um, understand what is available and that it's okay to utilize those resources. And actually, what we're doing is we're embracing them and saying, these are our key resources. So we've taken them through sessions. And look, the students are nervous at, fr at first because there's always been a blanket ban on using their iPhone in class. And actually, I make them take out their iPhone. I take out my iPhone. I show them some of the resources that I'm utilizing on a day-to-day -day basis and actually start to get them to discuss some of these topics in an open, fearless environment. Once they start to go through that, we actually provide lesson plans that direct them to these resources. And as they start to utilize these resources and become more confident, then we start to see a shift in what it is that they're looking up on social media and everything. They actually start to get more engaged with the process. But it has to be careful when you're going through. It has to be an incremental introduction. And I think, um, to me, the opportunities with social networking with Ning uh, are quite good because it's a controlled environment and it's quite a nice, safe way for the educators to start off with. And then they can move on to more advanced social media entities. But a simple direction to websites just to start them off and say, this is what I use. So you're mentoring them. You're, you're showing them that it's OK and this is of a quality that you find. And then starting a discussion afterwards on it would be a simple way. Does that answer your question? It's a challenge, and it takes a while. In all honesty, what I wanted to put out in this talk is, is to challenge our thought process and put something. I'm not trying to say everybody should quickly go home, find a load of blogs, record some podcasts, put them out there. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we should look and see what is out there and start to think about how you might harness it. So maybe take a session that you deliver, maybe a problem-based learning or a CBL case, and just have a look and see what social media resources might be useful there. 
and actually just put it into the session and see how your students react with it. So, so thank you very much. That was quite interesting. Uh, how much objective evidence is there on uh, the nature of the product? You know, the people who are coming through the pipeline using some of these new technologies, particularly uh, M-learning, uh, in comparison with classic systems of education? Sure. So um, these um, technologies are obviously pretty new. So what we're seeing is that the information is still fairly light, but um, uh, the, um, the um, academic medicine and um, uh, medical teacher have looked and, and shown some systematic reviews showing that these are of comparison with problem-based learning. And what we see is leaders in medical education, the University of um, Dundee, really starting to shift a lot of their problem-based learning into these kind of online forms. Not all, and I don't, I'm not saying this is a replacement, this is an adjunct and needs to be selectively utilized, but they found no change in their, uh, or no, well, they found no change in their outcomes of their examinations and their pass rates, but they have found benefits from time and um, productivity within their classrooms. So um, evidence is still on the lighter side, because it's quite new, but we're certainly seeing that it is not a negative effect. We're seeing that people are in line, and I think it's about educators starting to find out what other opportunities are out there. Though it's a different, and there's a lot of confounding factors, because we already, I know within my student base, that before we introduce anything, they're already using these resources. And we often have that they're not turning up to a lecture, because they've decided to watch something instead. They've decided to find, and we have a real challenge with that side. And so that's where we're looking that we have to embrace this technology, this disruption, um, and try and harness it. Otherwise, we'll be behind from that side. So I hope that tries to answer around. I think. So I appreciate your uh, presentation very much. But most of the time that we see the simulation or the, this kind of learning environment is used for cognitive domain and also psychomotor domain. Uh, can we apply this for the professionalism, teaching them professionalism? Sure. So uh, thank you. Yeah, um, so I think the, um, the evidence is probably a little bit still lighter on the professionalism. It's one of the key targets within the Society of Simulation and Healthcare is starting to look at developing areas on professionalism. And we've started to look ourselves at trying to integrate it through our curriculum in our, uh, in, in our simulations. And uh, we hope to be uh, producing some research on this shortly. Um, I think professionalism, I'll be honest, the University of Adelaide has it as one of our key problems. Um, and so it's one of our key outcomes, our challenges that we're trying to meet is uh, how do you effectively teach, um, uh, uh, help your students understand, believe in trying to get their skills in professional amount there. There's certain aspects of professionalism we certainly can teach through si simulation, but how do you actually change um, a student that comes in from an undergraduate from a, uh, from a school into being a professional doctor, and how do they adhere to the ethics and the challenges that are set down by the accrediting bodies? I think that is a challenge, and we can only uh, experiment. Um, we have tried by using um, a new program within uh, palliative care to look at um, professionalism through that and how the priorities can go through and seeing a patient and relating it back to the patient about why professionalism is so key to create that buy-in with the students. And we also have a collaboration with the Law Society um, where we do medical legal simulations where actually they go through cases and review the cases together. So it's law students and medical students learning off each other. And we hope that these means will lead to better professionalism outcomes. 
Um, but yes, um, the systematic review highlights, uh, the latest systematic review highlights professionalism as still an area of weakness in, in simulation from evidence point of view. Good morning. Uh, a lot of this is uh, based on us teaching the students. Who is teaching us to be able to use these apps? Yeah. I'm in the point where I have difficulty getting Skype to work properly. Yeah. And you brought up many apps that I've never even heard of. Yeah. So how do we teach the educators to be able to teach the students? Yeah. Especially in the rural area, which is a big focus of this yeah. seminar right now. They don't even know what many apps are. Yeah. So um, that, that is a key, key question. I guess... Um, from that side, you need to have someone that's interested within your group that is able to champion these um, technologies and these types on. And I also think you can look to your students to help to teach you. So within my student group, I have to admit, I'm self-taught. And if you uh, speak to my wife, uh, she will tell you stories about my engagement with computers normally. Um, I, however, found that these tools are excellent and really helped my teaching. So I grew an interest in it and worked at trying to understand what is out there. And I actually, as soon as I cracked the surface, I started to use these tools to develop myself. So there's an equal amount of resources online about how to utilize these tools. So the first thing to do is, uh, if you want to le learn to use Prezi, is you can go onto the Prezi website, and it takes you through really simply how to start to use those tools. There are lots of YouTube videos on how to use um, these tools in a flipped classroom approach. But I would engage in your students, because they're going to be far more switched on. And I would ask whether some of your students would be willing to help you develop some online or gain some understanding in these online things. Because I can tell you now, they're far beyond my skill bases. But I'd be happy to show you, and then maybe you could show someone else. And I think it's about having a certain buy-in from yourselves and a willingness to do it. Find a champion that can actually lead and provide the resources themselves. But create a plan of, watch this video, watch this, engage in this app, play with this, and start to look yourselves. Um, it took me about seven months to really be bought in and gain an understanding on everything uh, of everything I've showed you. Um, and there's so much more. Look, I'm very much still a learner. Uh, I feel that I can work my way around the social learning environment, and I'm starting to use more and more in my teaching. Um, but I've still got a lot to learn. But the more engaged I am, I'm learning it faster now. But you can do it at home. 20 minutes a night, have a play, follow a podcast. There's some absolutely astounding educational podcasts out there that will guide you through this matter. And that's something you listen to on a bus, while you're running, in a queue, maybe before you go to bed, if you don't have a little one. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Simon, for your such a great uh, start of uh, environment, learning environment today. So uh, in th this occasion, I would like to invite uh, Professor Chalem Varawit to give a token of appreciation for Dr. Simon, please. สำหรับเซสชันนี้ก็ได้เรียนรู้กันอย่างมากเลยนะครับหลังจากนี้ก็จะเป็นการแบ่งห้องนะครับเป็น2ห้องประชุมเหมือนเดิมนะครับก็จะมีหัวข้อที่น่าสนใจ2หัวข้อนะครับค่ะสำหรับค่ะสำหรับช่วงต่อจากเบรกทีเบรกนะคะจะมีห้องเซสชัน PS Parallel Session 4.1 นะคะ Teacher Professional Standard and Competency Mandarin A ค่ะ
เดี๋ยวสักครู่นะครับพอดีอาจารย์สุวัสด์จะมีประชาสัมพันธ์นิดนึงนะครับเพราะว่าจะมีเวิร์กช็อปซิมูเลชันที่รามาธิบดีนะครับอาจารย์เรียนอาจารย์ทุกท่านนะพอดีดรไซมอนเขาจะจัดเวิร์กช็อปสอนวิธีการสอนซิมซิมูเลชัน for interprofessional learning นะฮะที่รามาธิบดีนะครับพรุ่งนี้เวลาบ่ายโมงถึงบ่ายสี่นะครับที่อาคารเรียนรวมและโรงเรียนพิบาลรามาธิบดีตอนนี้จะมีที่ว่างอยู่สัก20ที่นะขอเรียนเชิญท่านผู้สนใจนะไปร่วมได้นะครับไปลงชื่อที่โต๊ะลงทะเบียนกันแล้วกันนะครับใครไปก่อนก็ได้ก่อนนะครับลงชื่อก่อนได้ก่อนเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเต็มเพราะท่านจัดได้ประมาณ40มีอาจารย์ที่รามากับอยู่ประมาณ20ผมก็เลยขอเรียนอนุญาตดรไซมอนว่าขอเพิ่มเป็น40นะครับเพื่อที่จะได้เรียนรู้ร่วมกันครับขอบคุณครับอาจารย์ครับค่ะขอบคุณอาจารย์สุวัสด์มากนะคะสำหรับประชาสัมพันธ์ซิมูเลชันเวิร์กช็อปนะคะขอประชาสัมพันธ์ต่อเลยนะคะช่วงช่วงเบรกนะคะแล้วก็พักเบรกแล้วเราจะมีแบ่ง parallel session เป็น 4.1 และ 4.2 นะคะสำหรับ 4.1 จะเป็น teacher professional standard and competency ห้อง Mandarin Room A นะคะห้องด้านนี้นะคะส่วน Parallel Session 4.2 นะคะเป็นเรื่อง Simulation Patient and Social Environment นะคะเ,เป็นห้อง Mandarin B C Room ค่ะส่วนหลังจากที่ Parallel Session จบนะคะก็จะมีพักรับประทานอาหารกลางวันอย่างเคยนะคะสำหรับวันนี้เนี่ยรบกวนท่านผู้มีเกียรตินะคะผู้เข้าร่วมประชุมทุกท่านนะคะแวะเอาคูปองอาหารตรง Register d e s ชั้นชั้นล่างนะคะชั้น G นะคะแล้วเดี๋ยวสตาฟของเราจะจัดสรรห้องสำหรับรับประทานอาหารให้ท่านเองค่ะครับแล้วก็อย่าลืมนะครับช่วงเย็น15นาฬิกาพิธีปิดนะครับก็อยากเรียนเชิญทุกท่านเข้าร่วมนะครับขอบพระคุณครับ